Welcome to Being Human. This week, my guest is Roger Nirenberg. He is the creator of the music paradigm and a conductor and a musical director. Um, Roger, welcome to the show. Thanks. <laughs> Delighted to be here. Uh, so the music paradigm is what I hope we'll explore in, in this episode. Uh, and it's about the lessons we can learn from an active or orchestra um, that we can apply to a business context. And there's a very strong theme around leadership in the work that you've done. Um, I wonder if we should start with the foundation of the music paradigm, when, where you first got the insight, who, who first approached you to work with them in business, where did it all start? Um, if we go back about 25 years, uh, all I did was, was conducting. I was music director for two orchestras. And I spent my life uh, in rehearsals and performances and uh, other duties of, of being a music director, such as making programs and engaging soloists and so forth. Uh, and it began to dawn on me that the, the principal impediment between me and the achievement of my artistic ambitions was the fact that there just wasn't a uh, robust enough audience to support the kinds of activities that I envisioned. Uh, and when I had these occasional uh, breakfasts with the uh, business groups, the Rotary Club and so forth, I found that when I talked about the, the coming concert, the music, the, the soloist, the guest artist, they listened to me politely. When I talked about the orchestra as a community institution, there was somewhat more interest. But when I talked about my job, that was not just casual interest. That was real engagement and, uh, and identification. And I began to conceive of using that interest that they had in the job of a conductor as a channel through which I could deliver music to them. And all this while, I was kind of challenging myself, was, was there a way to take members of the public who really had no, no level of comfort with classical music and, and felt quite alien from it. Was there a way to actually really engage them and, and reveal to them the kinds of things that made me devote my life to it? That was what I was thinking about. And through a whole series, through many, many years of experiments and thought experiments, I finally arrived at this formula of based on two principal things. One was that uh, I was going to put the audience in the place that I was when I fell in love with music, which was sitting inside the orchestra amongst the musicians. And the second thing was that the subject was not going to be the music itself because there was an inhibition that was so easily triggered the moment you started talking about it. And I wanted to avoid that inhibition, and I wanted to talk instead about something on which they felt strong, something that, that, that made them feel confident and made them feel intelligent, which music certainly did not. So I thought to myself, well, in America, what do, what do people care about more than anything else? And it's their careers. So I decided to make that the subject matter through which would create the channel that the, uh, would ultimately introduce them to music. That was how it came about. Right. And so you talk about these experiments and thought, can you remember like the, the is, is there a particular time when you first invited a, a, a business group into your orchestra? orchestra? I mean, I, I'm just interested in those very early tests of this idea. Well, there were all kinds of activities in which I was engaged, in, engaged, for example. There were high school concerts that I was conducting. There were music appreciation type concerts with demonstrations for the orchestra. I, I was always trying to make the music come alive. But, uh, and any time there was something that really worked, I made note of it. And eventually made this kind of patchwork quilt uh, that consisted of all these things that happened during my career. But there was one pivotal moment when, since I had always given a, a talk before each concert, 
there was uh, a member of my audience who was the CEO of a corporation, and he invited me to come and speak before his at a business meeting. And I said, I'd be happy to do it, but I want to know what the context was. And so I had about a three hour meeting in which he described the, the changes that the organization was going through and why it was that he wanted me to come and speak. And it was all about, it was about people conceiving of their jobs in a different way. And he wanted me to talk about teamwork in the orchestra. Well, by the time I heard what, what his, the business model was that he was changing, I said, well, you, what you want is a string quartet. You want your salespeople to behave like string quartet players in that they all had to know the entire picture. They may have one part that they specialized in, but they all had to know the whole thing. And so I brought a string quartet with me to give the demonstration. And, uh, and that was very well received. And then a week later, I was talking to yet another CEO who said, I want you to do that for my business, but I don't want the, the string quartet, I want the orchestra. And it was that invitation and then what I put together that was so successful and, and raised for me for the first time the possibility that this could be a legitimate way of orchestras expanding their audience and connecting with a segment of the population that we weren't really connecting with now. Right. And, and how was it that very first experience then when, so the CEO says to you, bring your whole orchestra and, and how does that work? I mean, what you, you bring them into a meeting room. I'm trying to, I'm trying to get the picture of that, that first moment with the entire orchestra. Well, that's as if it, you're, you're stating it as if the meeting room is an existing thing. What we did is we set up the room the right. way I wanted to set it up, which was basically an orchestra set up, but it was expanded so that the so that there were chairs for the for the participants to be seated amongst the musicians and um and then so that room is set up and then the at a certain point in the meeting agenda the the participants come into the room and um uh, there was a kind of a brilliance about the setup of which i was completely unaware i, I didn't realize the barriers that exist within business organizations to both change and learning. I mean, the moment you say you want people to learn or you want them to change, there's an automatic resistance. And there's tremendous resistance on the part of a workforce to getting lectured by their leaders. Uh, and, and so uh, as, as one person put it to me, there was one executive, I think it was from the Lockheed Martin Space and Missile Division, he, he came up to me, he said, we get these leadership things all the time. And he said, we all are really good at resisting them. He said, but this, nobody had any idea how to resist it. And okay. part of that was the fact that they would walk into this room and it was so unknown. And part of the, uh, the barrier that people have towards, towards change is the success that they've had and the kind of rank and prestige that they carry about their, their sense of themselves, which becomes a weapon against what they're being at, how they're being asked to change. So what I did was basically disarm them by putting them in an environment in which nobody really knew very much about anything. And furthermore, they didn't know what anything meant or what, what was going to be asked of them. And that was the idea learning for opening opening up the possibility, or that was the ideal environment for opening up the possibility that there, that there might be some kind of learning that they could take away from it. But that, like everything in the music paradigm, dawns on them gradually. So it's, it's a different kind of learning. It's learning by indirection. Uh, the direct thing is the orchestra and what happens in the orchestra in the relationships amongst the musicians, in the relationship between the musicians and the conductor. That's what we're talking about. But very soon people begin to see that this stands for something else. It stands for what is actually happening in their own organization. And I customize each session for that particular organization. So every demonstration that, that is going on 
is becomes for them once they understand it like looking in a mirror and seeing themselves by listening to the orchestra but they see themselves in a very special way and it's because of what music is because music is like a, a condensation of life it's much more intense it unfolds much faster more gets packed into it and in this mirror because the same kinds of things that might take a week to happen in their normal lives will happen in the course of 10 seconds. And when they see it in that mirror, it's much easier for them to connect the dots and make relationships that are there in their own lives, but they're kind of blind to them because they're unfolding so slowly and they can't, they can't actually make the connections. So this magic mirror, which is so artistic and so foreign and yet so revealing, so deeply revealing about the essence of what's going on becomes like a fascination. That's kind of the right. way it works. Hmm. And so I, I, I'm, getting, I'm getting the picture now and you, you do describe it really well in the book, uh, Maestro, Maestro. And so you've got a salesperson sitting next to an oboist and a, I don't know, a department head sitting next to a violinist and you're, and, and what are you having them do in this context then? So, so they're, they're not playing the instruments, right? They're, they're, they are they're... not. Oh, no, that would, it would, it would, it would make no sense. It would be a waste of their time to do that. It wouldn't even be amusing and it would be extremely irritating for the musicians. Right. The musicians, after all, are professional people. Um, so, um, so no, what they're doing is their observations, exercises. And I direct them in the beginning. Uh, the first exercise is select a, a musician and just watch what they're doing. And I give them a couple of guidelines. I say, you know, you'll all be fascinated by their incredible hands and the feats of coordination. But I talk, you know, you might be more interested in the strength that you see or the dexterity. But I say, it doesn't matter what you see. It's whatever your curiosity is drawn to. So then I ask the orchestra to play. And I'm kind of looking around, surveying the, the, the group, and I'm looking for somebody who's really kind of in following my directions because the majority are not. But there's some people who are doing what, what I ask them to do, which is sort of contemplating the act of, of playing a musical instrument. And then when we stop, I go up to him, and I leave the podium, and I go up, I hand the microphone to that person, him or her, and I say, so what did you see? And so... That's a, it's a very special moment because it really breaks the mold of the business meeting because most of the business meeting expectations are that somebody in the front of the room is going to be talking to you and telling you something and you're going to be absorbing that. It's, and they're not going to be asking you questions. And if they do, they're going to be asking, you know, the people are going to be raising their hands and they'll be calling on them. In this case, some person who's completely innocent is given the microphone, not only that, but is asked a question about something that they know nothing about. And furthermore, when you come right down to it, the stakes are high because this is happening in front of everybody who matters in your career. And everybody is very conscious of the fact that this is going to stick, that what happens here. So... It's actually, it's actually a fairly high-pressure situation. But my attitude towards it is extremely casual. And in addition to it, I take on the responsibility of validating whatever it is that, ha that they observe. To find in it the kernel of truth that's really important. And people are kind of surprised that here this casual observer just happened upon something that really mattered. But that's just my understanding of the orchestra and being able to, to validate that. So, so after that, the observations get more, more detailed and then more interactive. They begin to move from their chairs, some of them, whom I choose, from their chairs up to the podium and standing behind the conductor. So now they're becoming more and more engaged and there's more to talk about. That's kind of the progression. Right. And 
and what are the the types of things that people learn about themselves? I mean, I'm, I'm sure uh, there's a multitude of, of lessons, right, which depend on the context, but what are the types of themes that emerge? Well, for example, there's one exercise that I nickname the podium and the chair. It's when I bring a couple of people from the corner of the room, the distant corners, and I, I bring them up to the podium to stand behind me. And I say, your job is simply to listen to this music. You've already heard it a couple of times from your chair in the earlier demonstration, but now you're going to hear it from the podium and you're going to, you're going to tell us what it's like here compared to the way it was there. Well, you know, the orchestra creates a wave of sound and the wave is directional and it's all converging at the podium. Uh, something that most people don't realize. So the way the music sounds on the podium is totally different than, way, than the way it sounds in the chairs. And furthermore, I choose people on the perimeter where the, the wave is moving away from them. And so it's a very different sound than it is when the, when the wave is coming at you. It has much more energy. It has much more clarity. It's much more vibrant. It's, it's striking the difference. And that's what they, I asked them to talk about. Um, and uh, they, they say whatever observation they're going to have, often these observations are humorous because it's a vocabulary that they don't have. They didn't know how to talk about it. Um, but it's all very good hearted, you know, and, uh, and frequently in these sessions, there's a lot of laughter. Uh, and the laughter is not people telling jokes. It's just that the uh, absurdity of the situation uh, leads to laughter. But then I generally make the point, which is a really important point, about the fact that, first of all, when you compare what you hear on the podium to what you heard in the chair, you realize the chair has a lot of blind spots. There are things that you can't ascertain from that chair just simply because of its position. Um, and that it makes you realize that if you live on the podium, you don't really know that reality in the chair. And therefore, there is a kind of a, a gulf of misunderstanding, which is almost inevitable between any leader and the workforce that's taking direction. Because the same words have a different meaning when they're spoken on the chair than when they arrive, when spoken on the podium, than when they arrive in the chair. And any conductor, any beginning conductor, knows how easy it is to give a direction that makes perfect sense to you that leaves the musicians scratching their heads about what the devil did that mean and so I talk about the obligation of the leader to to have a kind of empathetic understanding about what what's going on in the chair so that the directions that you give make sense to them and the reaction you want from the person in the chair is I know what that means I have the tools to do that I can do that and if a leader gives those kinds of directions, you get cooperation. But because many leaders are not disciplined in this, what they end up doing is giving directions that evoke hostility. They, they evoke confusion. They evoke frustration. And they're very well-meaning, but they're not effective. And a lot of it is because of this misunderstanding about the podium and the chair, which is a fundamental thing about organizations. And because so many organizations are focused on aligning their workforce and making the workforce act as one thing, from the podium you realize what a challenge that is when everybody, when every chair has its own slightly different reality and they're all living in that reality. And furthermore, they believe that reality is the reality of their organization. It makes the challenge of alignment much more real. So that's, for example, one demonstration and the very important lesson, which is so easily accessible in that circumstance. It's so dramatic. And it's, right. not, and it's not theoretical at all. Yeah, exactly. It's not written on a PowerPoint slide. Somebody's had an ex a visceral experience of the difference between those two positions with all of their senses. I could, I could really... Yeah, and everybody is a participant in it as well. They're not... It's not something that they're they're learning about, they're living it. Right. And, and, and I mean, you mentioned earlier listening, but 
you talk about le- leading by listening, and that's a that's a that's a motif in the, in the book. And what w- what do you mean by that? Le- leading by listening. What's that about? That's a great question. Um, people think that conductors have a lot of authority. I mean, they, if there's one job in the world that speaks authority, you think of an orchestra conductor who issues orders to the musicians and the musicians carry out those orders. But that's not the reality. Uh, the reality is that very often uh, the orchestra's attitude toward the conductor is that the conductor is the one who's interfering with the music. Uh, And the conductor, meanwhile, these very, there's a streetcar who's passing by. Uh, We're in New York City here. Uh, A street cleaner, I mean. Uh, So the, the conductor is really dedicated and is really trying to contribute, but doesn't, doesn't really have credibility with the orchestra. And a lot of it is because the conductor doesn't really know how to listen to the orchestra. And I think that you can extend this very easily that most leaders don't know how to listen to the people whom they lead. And I think the source of it is that our education focuses a lot more on how we speak and what we put out than it is our ability to take in, to see in depth and to examine what's, what is meant by something and to examine what is said and what is not said and what is implied. There's, there's, a, there's listening deeply and comprehensively and understanding. When, when a conductor knows how to listen to the orchestra, orchestra the result is uh, cooperation and, and people coming together and working together. Uh, furthermore, when an orchestra listens to each other, they can accomplish almost anything. But a lot of times, they don't really listen to each other. Uh, they listen passively, but they don't listen with curiosity. And, um, I mean, uh, beginning conductors and bad conductors will, will recognize this and will say to the orchestra, you must listen, you must listen. But that's absolutely useless. It's, it's not saying anything. So how do you direct an orchestra to listen? How do you dr- a direct a workforce to listen to each other? Well, you have to you have to kind of lead them to what is it that's fascinating that's what's going on and which relationships are very productive and which kind of people have to cooperate. When you start working with an orchestra, they get very interested in each other. So the leader has to understand that that you are responsible for holding people accountable for listening and that part of the way that you do that is by being a fantastic listener yourself, but also to understand when listening is occurring and when it's not. And so listening is the fundamental currency of a workforce, even though it's generally not thought that way. But every transaction, even if it's an email, it involves being able to read the email and to find in it what the the real meaning is and to have the same intent as the person who sent it. And it's even worse with words when people, when people speak words. Uh, Did did I answer your question? Yes. Yes. Yes, you did. Uh, And that, and that the new insight I've just got from what you've shared is this idea that not only is this about me, listening to others it's about me listening how others are listening to uh, you know others right what what's the quality of listening across the across the patch right and where is listening exactly is it exactly not? and to and to listen in such a way that you can identify who who needs to listen better 
But if, I wouldn't say listen better. It's just who, by directing a, a particular section or a particular player's listening to somebody else, how will that cause everything to change and everything to shift and improve? That's the conductor's job is to know that and then to you simply offer it to the orchestra it's not even a direction it's just simply pointing out that you know you guys need to to collaborate a little bit a little bit more and maybe it's letting letting them hear what it is that they need to listen to alone and then play with that and see if they can have that in their ear while they're playing. And so what you're doing is you're, you're taking the, the circle of awareness because everybody in all times, in all of life has a circle of awareness. And what you want, you want to do is expand the circle of awareness so that they're taking in more, more of their, uh, of what's going on because sitting in an orchestra and reading your part and playing your part is not very interesting. The fascinating thing is what's going on in the orchestra. But if the ear is lazy, or if you've lost your interest in the job, or if it's so routine uh, that you're, you get lazy and you, you allow yourself to live in a small circle, of course you're going to be bored. Anybody would be. But that boredom is not, it's, it's not hostile. And it's by expanding that circle that suddenly the, the work transforms. And, and the same person who was indifferent or lacking energy begins to have much more curiosity and, and energy and, and gratification just because of what it is that they're taking in. Right. So it's, this, it's really important. You know, it's not just a, a little extra. Right. The other the other thing you talk about is is flow. What, yes. What do you mean by flow in an orchestra? Well, that's a great question and really important. Music has meaning by the way the sounds relate to each other, and if we take just a chord, let's say, if you imagine let's say the brass playing a chord. Well, if you take every single note and just hear it alone, well, that has some meaning, but it doesn't have anywhere the meaning of the whole chord, which now means so much more than just the collection of those notes, because it's the relationship of those notes. Well, that's the simultaneity, but imagine that a note has a relationship to other notes that succeed it and the ones that came before it as well. And those relationships are very, very meaningful. Those are the things that give the music its meaning, that make it poignant, poignant that, make it, that make it beautiful, that takes your breath away. But the, the ability to, to connect up those events and turn them into one larger event is what we mean by flow. It's this feeling that you're progressing through something, there's a direction to it, and, and there's, there's meaning and value that comes through the, the big picture. And the interesting thing is that when, when an orchestra is dispirited and when it's not really engaged, what they do is they, they produce for you all of the notes but they don't necessarily produce the flow between them, which gives all the meaning. In addition to which, when you don't have flow, everything becomes tedious, everything becomes difficult. And, and when, when flow comes back, or when you create the circumstances to, to enable flow, suddenly everything becomes so much easier. Uh, the same thing. So flow is enormously important. And the other thing is you have to understand is the workforce cannot create it. They can participate in it, but they can't create the circumstances. The, only the leader can create the flow. 
Only the leader is responsible for the flow. And I think it's one of the leader's most important jobs. Now, if we, if we leave the, the, the sphere of the orchestra for a moment and we go into the workforce, oh, that place where flow is abundant. There's, first of all, there's flow of money. There's flow of information. There's flow of material things, like in the supply chain. You know, like all living systems, in our body, there's tremendous flow. That's what keeps us alive, the flow in our body. And it's the same in organization. Things are flowing. Things are moving. But a lot of times we know that things get stuck. There are bottlenecks. Uh, people end up waiting or having to rush. And, and, uh, and suddenly the effectiveness of their work goes way down. And so to, to make sure that to manage the, the flow and make sure that it, it's continuous, that's the leader's job. Right. And, and what are some of the ways that a leader can, can cause flow be in a, an orchestra or in the work? Well, let's workplace. talk about in an orchestra. I frequently find myself saying to musicians, tell the story of your line. Um, and that gets them thinking in a different way. And then I'll, uh, I will suggest a kind of story, like this is the goal, you know. This is a story about how we get from here to there. And then they'll, they'll play something, but they may not have seen something. So I'll point out, I said, but that, when it takes that turn, that's the best part of the story. Or I'll say, when you started out, you're giving away too much. You have to begin with Once Upon a Time and then draw the listener into the story and engage them. So they start thinking about that. You, you talk about you know, goals. You talk about climaxes. You, I sometimes, you know, I borrow from the, the, the domain of the actor where, um, uh, what is the word? Every actor is supposed to have an objective. Your character has an objective. What is that character's wanting to be? And that the, the mixture of all those objectives creates the drama. Well, I try to get the musicians to have sometimes an objective about their goal like your your objective is that you want to play higher than the, the than the first violins do you second violins in a particular mozart symphony i ask for that because every time the line goes up it's a potential to achieve that that objective so all those things which get them to to see a, a with a wider lens um they bring about flow but I guess maybe the most important thing is the way you use the baton. Because if you use the baton in a kind of a digital way or a pointillistic way, that it's, it's connecting different points, right? That doesn't have any flow. It's the way the points are connected in the motion. And the interesting thing is that if, as a conductor, sometimes with, with a good orchestra and an orchestra that's listening well to each other, all you have to give is the flow. And if you look at, you know, very great conductors like Carlos Kleiber, where people say that sometimes he doesn't seem to be conducting at all, but that's not it. What he's doing is he's showing a higher level meaning and he's making the flow of the music much more readily accessible and trusting the musicians to execute the particular transactions and connections. And I think that's directly applicable to other kinds of ex executives as well, who frequently misunderstand how they add value. They think they add value by getting into the work of their people. And, and what that does is that gums up the work. If they could understand what, how the leader can create the circumstances to get the work flowing, then it's so much easier for them to do the work. And then they feel a very cooperative relationship with the leader as opposed to this, this tolerating the leader's ineffective presence. Right. I mean, let's right. face it. Let's face it. Most workers don't have a very high regard for the people who manage them. And, and I think 
It's because management and leadership is very counterintuitive. It's, it's very misunderstood. I believe it can be understood and it's really fascinating. And the orchestra metaphor is just, it's a fantastic place for the contemplation of it. Right. Yeah. And what I'm getting from what you're sharing now is that there's something that the leader does in achieving flow, which is having people connect dots, which is having them see a, a bigger narrative. Uh, and is having them, I suppose, connect the past and the future in some way. So it's, it's, it's like an elevation of the consciousness of the people. And I know that sounds quite highfalutin, but it, it, that seems to me like what you're saying here. Am I yeah, well, that? you say it really beautifully. I re, uh, talking to you, I remember the chapter that I wrote about flow, and I talked about the beanbag game, where it's, it's very, because it's oh, very, uh, well, yeah, well, you, uh, it's, the, it's not the beanbag game, it's the rock game. Yeah, and you same. have these two, two rocks in front of you, and the first thing you do is you click the rocks, and then you put the rocks in front of the person, you're seated in a circle. And you put it in front of the next person, who put, and the person to your left has put their rocks in front of you. And then you pick it up, and then you click it, and then you put it down there, and then you pick up the new rocks, and you click it. And so, theoretically, the rocks travel around in a, a counterclockwise direction. Right. Uh, but what happens when you play the game, um, is that the rocks start to pile up because somebody, somebody can't, can't manage the rocks and, and it's all broken down. And so that's because in that circle, there's no flow. And what causes, what breaks it up is that people tend to focus on just their acts, what they do, step one, step two, step three, which is a kind of digital thing. Eventually, what people learn is that there's a kind of feeling, a rhythm, a flow to it. And that if you, you join the flow, you become as interested in the rocks that are coming to you and the ones that you've given away. It's all part of one process. And then it becomes, suddenly, it becomes very easy. What you had struggled with, you're now having ease because the flow is what enables it. And the other metaphor that I use for this is the riding of a bicycle. Because, uh, of course, for a beginner, it seems impossible. You get on the bike and you fall down. And it's impossible to stay up. What you don't realize is that when you start to get into it, there's, there's this force that magically appears and that holds you up. But then you have to, you have to allow it to enter into that. And that's exactly the feeling of flow, that things become easy. And there's this, there's this benevolent kind of force that takes over and the work suddenly becomes very pleasurable and very easy to accomplish. Right. But if I take the example of the, of the rocks and we're sitting in a circle and we're clicking our rocks and, and somehow we, we all tune into this, this magic flow, right? And we, and we catch the rhythm. That didn't require a leader, right? So does... Well, uh, you're right. You're right that the leader does not take part in the execution. But the leader's job is to, is to observe what's going on and then to give some kind of suggestion about how people might redirect their attention. So that... I mean, it's a very good metaphor, this, because a leader, you know, who, who gets in and says, let me show you, and gets into the circle and starts doing it, is not really helping the, the group. The group has to find that themselves. And so what a leader will do, will try to be, you, know, you find the people who are doing it really well. You find the people who aren't doing it very well. You, you focus on the relationship between them. So you might, like, I'm just imagining myself in this situation, you might just take two people and have everybody watch and, and have them demonstrate it wrong first and then have them demonstrate it right and then say, well, what is the difference? Have them explain it. 
and now let's let's have four people do that and so you're not participating in it but what you're doing is you're you creating the circumstances for them to discover something that they could have they're on the cusp of having it but they need to be guided in order to do that i think that's what leaders need to do and of course listening in this case becomes uh observing and and observing comprehensively and having some notion about what's missing what what consciousness would enable them to do this right that and that sense. might be done with somebody in the mailroom about how they, you know, of course they're doing their job, but it could be much more effective if they understood the value chain. You know, value chain is the thing that the process, the business process that, that moves from one stage to another stage to another stage at each stage, adding value. So at the end you have the product, but the product has all that value, which has been added onto it. Well, that's something that flows. But a lot of people, they don't see the value chain. They just see their little process in it. They're part of it. And, of course, that's very boring. Uh, but if you get them to see, get curious about and see more of the value chain, now not only does the work become more interesting, but they begin to find ways to innovate, to, to be more efficient, to have fewer errors, to have greater speed, greater accuracy, all these things that businesses live on and crave. Right, right. Yeah, and <clears throat> that's interesting because a lot of the, the, the people we speak to who, who focus entirely on this idea of flow in the workflows will, will also link it to this, this idea of, of, of joy and people enjoying their work. And, and actually, these are two, these are in some senses the same thing. Um, when we're observing flow, we're also observing people in enjoying what they do and, and, and getting gratification from it. But let's think about why they enjoy it. You know, that, of course, it's true that people feel joy, but w I like to look at it a little bit more deeply. What is that? That's people connecting with each other. That's people sharing with each other. It's a very social thing. It's a collaborative thing. It's a... Uh, it's a kind of a game, you know, and, and it's a way of feeling that you're part of something bigger that has greater meaning than what you alone make. You know, all those things come about, which is why, you know, with good conductors, it seems so very easy. It seems like they're doing nothing. What of, and in a way they are doing nothing because they've created the circumstances w where the orchestra does everything, but that's because they created that circumstance. It it that wor a workforce will not default to that, and if it falls off of it, it needs to be put back into it. Right. Right. And then, if I can say one more thing, when you've when you've created that dyna dynamic. And, and this value chain is flowing and it's running itself. Well, what does the leader do then? You're not on vacation. Well, then what you do is you begin to look beyond the whole thing and think about the forces outside of you that are, that are ultimately affecting what's going to happen. You start looking further into the future. You look further in your own field. You look for where are the what are the trends where's the innovation what's the state of the art and you have the space to do that because you're not having to put out fires and manage things in in the organization because you've created the circumstances for that to work right yeah no that's uh that that makes that makes a lot of sense and actually the people i've spoken to who who lead organizations with very high levels of flow um, have very empty diaries. And I think the, the, the metaphor works in that sense. They're not involved in everybody's work. Uh, they've, as you say, they've created the circumstances where there's a lot of a natural flow in the organization and they, they don't need to get so involved. And as you say, that gives them space to, to look elsewhere. And looking elsewhere is really important. The way 
uh, I believe it's uh, Stephen Covey in uh, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People when he's talking about the difference between leadership and management. He said if, if the workforce is, is clearing its path through a jungle and there's a machete, you know, and they're, they're cutting, cutting away and creating a path, the leader's job is to climb up to the highest tree and take a look and say, wait a minute, we're in the wrong jungle. <laughs> you know, right. the, yeah. the, the managers, the ones who are managing the clearing of the path. Yeah. So that's a very important function. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I can, yeah, I can, I can see that. And just briefly coming back to the idea of the types of interventions that the leader makes in order to achieve flow. One thing that really struck me in the book, um, as somebody, I'm not a musical aficionado, was was one of your, um, well, I suppose, fictional musicians talks in the book about the problem of going my own way. And the worst thing that can happen if there's another musician who's trying to get it right. And one of the things she talks about is there's a lot of concentration within an orchestra to stay in tune. And I'm thinking from the outside, well, that's getting the note perfectly, playing it perfectly. And she says, no, it's not that. Because it's what you really want to do is find the, to be in tune with each other. So even if you're not perfectly in tune, uh, you don't want to stick out. So if you're perfectly in tune, but the people around you aren't, then the audience will hear that. So it's much better to sync with the, the musicians around you than it is to try and achieve some sort of perfect note. Uh, or at least that's my translation of it. Could you say a bit about that? Because I, I, I found sure. that a yeah. good insight. Well, you've introduced a really important topic. Um, and it is uh, ambiguity. Uh, a lot of organizations talk about that. Uh, I don't know whether you know the term VUCA, V-U-C-A, but it stands for Volatile, Uncertain, Complex, and Ambiguous. And it is the challenge of organizations in our time because when you have a a dramatically changing world in which what's coming is not like what has been and what's coming is very potentially disruptive. Let's say you're in an industry and there's going to be a, a, a company which is very innovative and is going to find something that just blows everybody out of the water. That's a cliche. Let me say it better. Uh, that, um, that suddenly makes it unprofitable for all the businesses, the other businesses, because this has changed the game. That's disruptive. I mean, it could be that way. The, the disruptive could be that there's, you know, there's a, a fire and your plant is destroyed or something. You know, disruption is something that changes the game. Uh, and that's where the, the circumstance is volatile or it's uncertain because you don't know what the important, what the rules are. It was described to me if, by, by a client of mine who's doing a, a lot of their business in the third world and because of the, the, the resources there. And they said, if you want to, you want to, you know where you want the plant to be, you know, but there's no government to talk to. You don't know who to talk to. Uh, you know, that's uncertain, you know, and that's a real situation. It's not made up. Uh, so volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And a lot of a lot of the our training is to deal with things that are are like on IQ tests that, that are known and you figure it out and all that. But the amb ambiguity is something else, and how to act act decisively and comfortably in ambiguity. Uh, that's become very important. And the the metaphor that you were just talking about about playing in tune is a very apt representation of it because if you get everybody trying to be right, it will always be out of tune. What you need to do is, is and, and, and musicians will gravitate to this because they're very good at it, uh, that they will, they will understand, we don't know where the pitch is going to be, but we know it's going to, we're, we know that we're going to reach agreement somewhere and our job is to find it 
and to contribute to that. And that, then that becomes our standard, unless for some reason it begins to change, and then we will change with that. So another, another manifestation of ambiguity in the orchestra is the question of time, which seems like it should be so obvious. But the fact is that if everybody started to play their note at the same time, it would never be together because some instruments respond very, very quickly, like a xylophone. You know, the moment you touch it, the sound pops out. But the double bass responds very slowly because the, the strings are so thick and so big. And so therefore, everybody, and there are some people who are really close to the center, and there are other people who are quite far away. So everybody has to make some kind of understanding about how they have to perceive and behave towards time that enables the orchestra to act as though they're all playing one instrument all in the same place. But that is a mastery of ambiguity. And, and the orchestra is amazingly comfortable with ambiguity. Uh, and so it, it's an inspiration if people were to understand that, about how you can act decisively and you can commit to something even when the situation is completely ambiguous. Yeah, no, and, and, and ambiguous and not, um, not in keeping what I be- with what I believe to be true. Because I, I, I know from my own experience that when I'm at my worst as a leader is when I'm, when I'm trying to be right. And I and I'm for whatever reason I can't let go of of this attachment to whatever my version of right is. Uh, but when I can let go of that and sort of swim in that ambiguity and feel for where the flow is, then I can be much more effective. And yeah. and and I suppose a leader from the outside noticing that and noticing where somebody's got perhaps stuck in being right or got stuck in wanting to be in tune, then. Uh, according to them, th- then maybe that's another op- opportunity for an intervention from, from a leader from the outside. Well, I think that must happen thousands of times a day uh, mm. because, you know, fe- being right feels good. It feels righteous, as a matter of fact. And uh, a lot of times it's the booby prize, that, that feeling of righteousness, because you might be right and meanwhile causing all kinds of damage around you. Um, and so, uh, but I think leaders can be very clever in, in moving people off of that righteous feeling into another kind of feeling without making them feel wrong for having wanted to be right in the first place. It's instead, it's like, that's one kind of right. Well, let's play with another kind of right feeling. Uh, and that involves expanding the, the circle of awareness uh, and the circle of consciousness and the definition of what time is. Because once again, with flow, flow is the thing that's connecting the past into the future. And so it's not about a particular, particular moment. Being right is a snapshot of one particular moment, if you extend that moment a little bit, there might be more flexibility in, in getting people off of that rigidity. Mm-hmm. And that's, I mean, and that is very common in organizations that some teams will move, it just, just taking that timing point in isolation, you know, some, some teams will m- work a much faster pace than others. Uh, and then we'll, we'll very quickly make the, the slow team wrong, right? You know, and, and yes, so right. finding finding a cadence that which works a, a, across the piece is, is yeah. as you say, that's the real, the real, or, or that's another way of being right, actually, right? Yeah, finding. and that's why when when a leader intervenes and gets people working together, and it's very successful, the general feeling is not about the leader. Right. It's about us, right? And, you know, the leader, and I certainly had this misunderstanding when, when I was beginning. I thought that the leader is celebrated because of his or her great leadership, great knowledge. There's some kind of traffic thing here. I'm sorry. Um, you know, some, 
some knowledge or superiority or something, and everybody, everybody celebrates the leader and how wonderful they are and everything. But successful leadership, a lot of times they don't think about the leader. The leader becomes kind of invisible because you're enabling the work to be done by the people who are doing it. Mm. Yeah, there's that quote, the good leader is, uh, is he who is revered and the great leader is he of whom the people say we did it ourselves. Um, that's right. I, I exactly. think that's Lao Tzu, isn't it? Right. So, so yeah, yeah, that's, that's what you're pointing to. There. Yeah. Well, you're asking really good questions. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I th- yeah, I mean, w- we seem to have had a very rich um, a conversation and touched on a lot of points I wanted to to cover. Um, well, I suppose where's your edge right now with this? What what are you bumping up to it, with with the music paradigm? Is there is there an you know? Let's say you're looking out now. Presumably, some of this is in flow now, and you've got some some space to look out. Where, where's the where's the boundary for you to to push this next? Well, another excellent question. Uh, There are a couple of ones. Um, I invented the music paradigm because I wanted to contribute to developing a new audience and new relationship with, with the audience. And every time I do a session, I feel as though I make a small contribution to that, but the contribution is small and I still have the ambition to make a, uh, a noticeable contribution to my own field. Um, and in the orchestra field, I think uh, there's a great deal of rigidity of thought. Mind you, you know, it's populated by great people, great, great musicians, and extremely dedicated people on the, on the management side, and the organization side, who are very, very dedicated to it. But the, but it's locked into, um, it's kind of a, there's a poverty consciousness, I guess that's the way I would put it, because we, we in the arts, we, we generally don't make money. We often lose money. Uh, and, and there are some people who have to somehow come up with the money in order to keep us afloat. And that's a very, that's a very difficult job and a very high responsibility um and so uh it when there's poverty consciousness it tends to to narrow the range of possibilities and you have such scant resources that you uh you apply them very um very stingy way and so the kind of innovation that that fascinates me which is the whole notion of the orchestra as a huge resource for leadership development and organizational awareness and all that idea hasn't really gotten that much traction in the real world except in the little context that i've that i've created which is not so little. I mean, it, it's international, the work that I do, and, and many organizations, many great and famous organizations have, have done it. But to be able to make a contribution to an orchestra, that lies in my future. And uh, I'm always thinking about, well, how, you know, where is the transformation? Where is the where is the way of bringing this about? But I build castles in the sky about um, a, a kind of a concert that I could put on, which is almost entirely funded by the, the fees, the leadership development fees that are raised by the various demonstrations that the orchestra does. And in this case, the demonstration would just simply be rehearsals because I have found a way to derive great training value by people just sitting in and watching me rehearse. It consists of me delivering an orientation for them first, in which I describe what the challenges are um, and what, 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 what I'm facing up to, what, what, what I'm trying to accomplish, what my budget is, 
and uh, and what the what the tools are. And I always customize that orientation around what I know those people's leadership challenges to be as well. So they 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 have some point of entry to understanding the rehearsal. And then after the rehearsal, we meet again and we talk about well, what happened. What did you see? You know, uh, what were the tools? What could you use? That kind of, well, to, to, uh, to do that and, and to raise, you know, what would be substantial revenue, uh, that's revolutionary and that is disruptive, in fact. And so that's what I'd like to do. That, however, is a, a, a great summit. And the path up there is very it's high. It's very high elevation. I'm at base camp one there. Another challenge, which I think may be not as lofty, but I think important, is that there's so much depth and so much meaning that, come, that is revealed in, in my sessions that people can't really take it in all at once. It's way too rich. So what I'm trying to figure out is how can I deliver value to my clients without actually having to be there myself? What, what can be done? And that's a fascinating, it's a fascinating challenge. Uh, and, you know, it's one thing to create something that is uh, that works that exists already in the world and you're just creating another version of it but i tend to inhabit the world of things that haven't been and and it's always much more difficult to bring them about because people don't have a clear frame of reference for it they can't you can't really explain it to them because it hasn't yet existed so exactly what that intervention would be, what kind of training, that's something I give a lot of thought to. And, um, uh, and so I would say I work on that every day. Right. Those two things. Right. It seems to me, I'm just listening to you speak there, that if a big part of building a successful business is building a successful community, a productive community, um, if we take that premise, then then music as a means for community building has been, you know, a part of human history for forever, right? I mean, yes, and and yet it, it, it's somewhat reduced right now to the types of workshops that you hold or the the offsite, you know, the the, the that that sort of crazy executive who will sign up for some kind of music workshop. It it it's it's in that territory right now, and it seems to me. That, that, that almost that, that it's almost the question why not why do we not have music as as a playing a greater role in our day-to-day -day interactions in the workplace it's it's an interesting question well i think it it says a lot about the evolution of our society uh and our collective confusion about how to make use of there's wonderful possibilities and tools that are put at our disposal, like the ability for me to talk to you this way, you know, out of my own office here, it, it's the easiest thing here. And of course, we're utilizing it right now, but a lot of the, a lot of the, the, the effect of the technology is to, um, is to minimize the value of the live experience because the live experience uh, has, you know, it is the thing that builds community. And, uh, and of course, live music is the thing that we musicians worship because we know that, that you can't make it sound no matter how you, you increase the fidelity of your system. The, the, the depth, the dimension, the, the vibrancy of the sound of live music is, is very special. And people are finding, they're finding all kinds of entertainment available in their own living rooms. Um, they never really need to go out, even if you want to 
you want to find great music played by great orchestras, you know, you can have that in your living room. And so, and then along with this comes the changing roles in our society, the changing roles of women and, and, and the difference in the relationship between, between the sexes. And, you know, I, I, when I began my career, it was still in certain places, women generally didn't work. They stayed at home and, and the symphony orchestra became, was a necessary community institution because it enabled people to get out of the house. Well, we don't live in that world anymore. We haven't for a long time. And so what is the place in, um, for these values? It's, uh, it's a bit of a mystery. And uh, I get dizzy a little bit just thinking about that challenge. But I have found my way to contribute to it. And uh, I've come to the realization that there's something unusual, not, not only unusual, but very effective about what it is that I've invented. So I'm trying to figure out what to do with it. And uh, well, I'm entirely inspired by your your mission, and um, yeah, it's uh, it, it it seems to me that it's uh, it's a natural step for a lot of us interested in how do we create more humane workplaces, and that's definitely part of my mission with this this podcast is how how can uh, how can we create but deeper connections with individuals in the workplace and. And this just seems to be a very powerful con contribution to that conversation. So, yeah, I am, I'm very hopeful you, you find ways to expand, to expand your work. Maybe one of the ways will be, and I, I'm, I'm working on this, is to become more embedded in a particular organization. And to, because when I began this, I thought, well, for sure, they will know how to, how to pass this through the organization. It took me... Uh, well over a decade to realize that business organizations have absolutely no idea to do that. But I do. I have, a, at least I have a vision of how to do it. And by experimenting with that for, on behalf of an organization, I think that I would learn a lot and would figure out how to then scale that out and help many more. That's an interesting idea, isn't it? A sort of a musical enabled enterprise, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, that was, that was the part of the original vision that, that, an organization adopts a symphony orchestra, not because of uh, it's part of their charity, but because they derive so much benefit by that relationship that through what they learn from the musicians, they are so much better able to succeed in what they're trying to do. Mm. Right. A, a sort of grand version of an in-house poet or, right. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. No, I, uh, yeah, I could, I could, I, could, I mean, I, I, it's, it's funny to me, that sounds a very an eminently productive thing for an organization to do, but it probably sounds pretty radical to, to a lot. To a lot well, of I, I, we live in a world uh, in which people are, um, a lot of them are really, they're fearful of looking bad. And they will default to something which is tried and true, albeit, you know, somewhat mediocre, rather than something which might reflect badly on them. Mm. And that's something that, that, we're all, that the music paradigm is always fighting against. And uh, for the people who are the, the clients of mine, you know, the, the, who have championed it before it happens and they're nervous about, you know, whether it's going to work, and I say, this is going to be one of the great days in your career. And, and it is that the, the, the people who discovered the music paradigm and brought it to their organizations, inevitably, they get more elevated in their, in their organization. They have so much more credibility and so much greater status because they were the ones that discovered this. Mm. So maybe we'll see a world of, of the chief musical officer. Well, I'm not sure I'll live to see that. <laughs> if it's done right, it could be great. Right. Yeah, I can see that. Okay. Uh, this, this podcast is called Being Human. So uh, final question, Roger. For you, for you what, what, does it, what does it mean to be human? It's the easiest, easiest thing in the world. <laughs> we are human. 
But I think that's not just the question. There's more that you're asking than that. Um, yeah. How do we take advantage of being human? Um, well, I think, of course, there are a thousand different ways this question can be answered. I would say that it's important to locate your inspiration. It's important to know when you're inspired, not to sort of just have it pass by, but to recognize this is a moment where I really felt inspiration. And then to, to contemplate that. What does that suggest? What, what is it a sign of? Because in that, that feeling of inspiration is a clear indication about what your destiny is, what, what you're here for. Uh, and I think we need to both be charged by that, recharged by it, but also strategically we need to, in, in making decisions about our life and charting our course through life, we need to be guided by, by that. Um, and what we have learned about ourselves and about the world, because not only can you, I mean, if you just find your own inspiration, but it doesn't have any place in the world, I don't think you've accomplished a whole lot. That, that what you want to do is you want to, to find what it is that inspires you and what that says about the, the way that you can make a contribution in the world. That's what uh, is cause for endless contemplation because um, that's, what, that's what makes living uh, have a feeling of flow, that you're participating in something which is bigger than yourself. Uh, so I would say that's the way I would answer the question you asked. Thank you. And I've certainly experienced uh, inspiration and flow in this conversation, so, so thank you. Um, so we'll put the links to the, the music paradigm in the... In the in the description for the show, um, is there anywhere else you'd point people to who'd taken an interest in the in the themes today? Well, maybe I could I could give you a link to a particular video that you okay. can also put on that. Sure. Um, and uh, of course, there's my website, which is musicparadigm.com, uh, and there you that's the way to make contact with me. It's also the way to uh, there are blogs that I write, and there are um, you know, there are videos and, and uh, things that I think will be of interest. Um, there's even a Facebook page, and uh, many people have become friends. And um, that's it for now. Okay. Well, we'll put the link, we'll put the link to the website, to the video you've just mentioned, and, and the Facebook page. Fantastic. Well, it just remains to thank you for your time. It's been a fantastic conversation. Well, I enjoyed it a lot. Great. Um, yeah. And uh, enjoy the rest of your, your day in New York. Thank you. <laughs>